All right, so the next thing I want to do is I just want to uh, look at some problems where, uh, you know, we can solve the problem top down or bottom up. But maybe, you know, the time complexities are not what you would expect them to be, because normally you expect the top down solution and the bottom up solution have the same time complexity, right? Okay, so here is uh, kind of our first problem. Uh, so this is kind of a very simple problem, actually, and this is like the kind of the intro problem that appears on uh, this like online judge platform called Sphere Online Judge. Um, and you know, this is kind of like one of their like intro problems. It's called the Byte Landian coins problem. It's like a very classic problem, and yeah, you can find an online judge on this. So you can also try to do this one, but I think it actually kind of is a simple problem. So maybe you know, maybe you wouldn't bother doing this one for homework. Uh, so basically, the idea is you are given a, you are given this like special coin. You are given a special coin that has a number on it, like let's say n. And basically, here's the thing that you can do with these coins. Either a coin of n can be cashed in for n dollars. You you, you, know, you may give somebody this coin, they give you n dollars, or it is also possible to trade these coins for three other coins. And the coins that you get are n over 2, n over 3, and an n over 4. Now, the only thing here is that all the coins have integers on them, so all these divisions are truncating. So, uh, I mean, otherwise, if that were not true, you would always actually want to trade here, because um, <clears throat> You know, if you think about it, uh, like n over 2 plus n over 3 plus n over 4, if there's no truncation, that is like algebraically, right, better than, better, better than n. So you would actually always trade up, be, you know, you would always trade into these coins if there was no, like, truncating division. Because it means that when you exchange n, you get n plus 2, n plus 3, n plus 4, and even if you were to sell them after that, you would get more than this initial n dollars. <laughs> but these coins are integers, so that's not always the case. Like, for example, uh, let's say like you have a coin of 7, right? For this coin, you're only going to get 3. You don't get 3.5 here. You, get, you only get 3 because all the coins are integers. And here you get 2, and here you get 1. So, for example, for a coin of 7, you have the option to trade it for $7, or you have the option to trade it for these coins. Now, um, this by itself is not enough to establish that you actually should trade for the dollars. Because these are not three dollars, this is not two dollars, this is not one dollar, these are coins. You have to still see uh, whether you might be able to trade the coins for, like, this coin can be traded for three, this can be traded for two, this can be traded for one, but if you do that, that's worth six, and this is better. But maybe you can still use the coins in some way that earns more than that amount of money. But it turns out that you can't, because for example, if you look at like what you get for a three coin, you will see that you get one. If you trade it, you will get one, one, and zero. And if you get a coin that's zero, like, like we'll see, see what zero does. Zero, zero either gives you zero dollars, or it gives you three more zero coins. So zero is worthless. Zero, you can kind of infinitely keep trading it for like more and more zeros, but you can never get anything that's not zero. And when you cash in those zeros, it's still zero. So a zero coin is basically worthless. So conceptually, when you trade in a three coin, you would get a one and a one. And what happens when you trade in a one coin? You get all zeros, so you would never trade it in. Because these are all truncating division, right? So if you trade a one, you get all zeros. So the only thing to do with a one coin is to sell it. Uh, and, and so basically, this one coin can only be sold. This two coin will just generate a one coin, so that's not good. Like, a two coin will generate one, one, one zero, zero, so just a one coin, which only sells for one dollar. So two coin you would also sell. And then a three coin generates one, one, zero, so again, a three coin you would, you would always choose to sell. So uh, these coins, the best thing to do with them is to just sell them, and so this is worth six dollars. And so, for example, for a seven coin, you would prefer to cash in directly rather than trade it. You always truncate them? Yeah. That's what truncating usually means, yeah. Trunca trunca it's truncating division, which means you lose the remainder. Yeah, but other coins, for example, we can see clearly that it's better to trade. 
Like, for example, let's say you have a 100 coin, right? Let's say we trade it, so we, get, we would get 50, 33, and 25. And now look here, even if you were to sell these coins on the spot, you're already earning more than $100, right? If you trade a 100 coin, coin you get 50, 33, and 25. And even if you were to sell the, these coins on the spot, you get more money. Uh, but actually, you, maybe you can do even better by further trading those coins. So one thing is clear. Like, the reason the trade is not always better is just because uh, of the truncation. And clearly, for large enough numbers, the truncation effect is negligible. Right? So, uh, so yeah, you can could, you could actually come up with a simple solution. I think you can actually prove that for, like, n greater than some number, like, I think it was, like, 23 or something. Like, like there's like basically some number, which is, like, the largest number at which it ever makes sense to, tr to cash in directly. And that number is like some pretty small number. It's like 24. Like you can do it just by taking some algebra. Like basically, uh, you, you can just apply some algebra to this. You can basically say, okay, n over 2 truncated is always at least the algebraic n over 2 minus 1. Right? Like this is greater than the algebraic n over 2 minus 1. This is greater than the algebraic n, n minus over 3 minus 1. And then you can basically set up an equation where you say, uh, where, where you say basically, uh, when will this be bigger? This is worth at least n over 2 minus 1 plus n over 3 minus 1 plus n over 4 minus 1. And, and uh, you know, when, when is it true that n is definitely smaller than this? Uh, well, if you do like the fraction math and whatever, this adds up to 13 12. So you, you, end, you end up getting some equation like n is, when is, you're asking when is n less than, uh, yeah, I think, I'm, I think I didn't make it clear. Yeah, when is n less than something like this? And when you do the math, um, you, you know, you, you would find that actually, like here, I think you get n is. You know, n is greater than or equal to 36. Uh, but in, in practice, like the number is even less than that. So, like maybe you could just kind of determine the answer for all the cases from like 1 to 35, and then above that you always trade. So there could be like some stupid answer like that, right? Uh, but let's say you kind of did it the simplest way possible without like reasoning too much about the math. So first, like you know, is the problem statement itself clear? Don't worry if you didn't understand this like n greater than 36 thing, it doesn't really matter from what we're about to do. Uh, but is the problem statement itself clear? Like basically every coin you can either cash in for n dollars or you can cash in for these three coins. Coins can be further traded and cashed after they're obtained. And basically the goal of the problem is just like maximize your total cash at the end. Like trade the coins in an optimal way so that um, you know, your uh, cash in the end is optimized. Okay, so very so this clearly seems like a like dynamic programming sort of thing because I mean after all we can write in, in a recurrence very easily, right? So here's our recurrence. F of n, zero, if n equals zero, okay. Otherwise, um basically it, it's just like you know, and this is the beauty of kind of like a lot of dynamic programming algorithms, that they're kind of like almost like correct by definition. Like, it's just the definition of the problem, right? The definition of the problem is that you're supposed to take the better of, you know, you want the best solution, so you take the better of n, you know, cashing in the coin directly, and uh, what you would get, like all divisions are truncating divisions, all you would get after the best trading of the following coins, right? Okay. So, you know, very like simple recurrence, right, that solves this problem. Okay. So, like top-down solution, you just, you know, apply the cash transformation, you know, you get this. <clears throat> Everybody clear on like the solution? I mean, it's, you know, it seems like really straightforward to solve it this way, right? And it's like an intro problem uh, on Sphere Online Judge. You know, all divisions are truncating, but you just use integer math, works out. Okay, um, but 
Uh, let's, let's say now we want to solve the problem bottom up. Okay, how do you solve the problem bottom up? Like, not a trick question. Well, actually, it is a trick question, but like, I want you to answer it as though you don't know the trick, uh, so you get caught in the trick. Uh, so, like, like if, you, if you're thinking this is not a trick question, what do you think the bottom up solution is? Start at F if I have, zero and one, two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I have uh, four, I only have to go to four, right? Because if I have less than four, then n by four will give me zero. Otherwise, if you give me. No, no, I'm talking about like evaluation order. So, like, this is the formula. Like, evaluation formula doesn't change. Like, this is the formula either way. But, like, in terms of. Um, in terms of like the order in which you evaluate the cases, right? So top down, we'll just use recursion to figure out how to order these cases. But bottom up, you, you, are, you have to supply your own evaluation order. And then instead of calling the function recursively, here this will, like this f of n over two will be replaced with cache of n over two, cache of n over three, cache of n over four. Like basically, you know, this will get replaced with cache of n, and this will get replaced with, like every mention of f will get replaced with just a mention of cache, there will be no recursive calling, and you will be responsible for supplying your own ordering of these functions. Yeah? So you just have to do bottom up, up into like m over 2? Just, you can stop there? Oh, well that's also true, but I'm not interested in like micro-optimizations. I was going to say, like, intuitively, you would think that, you know, you would, eat, you would uh, start from like 0 and go up to n, right? Or, okay, you can stop at n over 2, sure, because you, you know that, like, n, like, let n be the final number you want to get. You, you, yeah, sure, you can compute all the values from 0 to n over 2, and then stop there, right? But you will compute, like, all the values between 0 and n over 2. Okay, what's the time complexity of that? Very easy, not a trick question. Okay, yeah, sure. So, so okay, so bottom up. Okay, great, so bottom up. To our time complexity is this. And now I will also announce the time complexity of the top-down solution. Uh, so bottom up, very clearly, like no mistake here, it's order n, right? OK, what do you think the time complexity of the top-down solution is? Is it order n? That's actually closer. It's not, it's not log n, but um, it's the square of the logarithm. The, uh, like this notation, for those who don't know it, like it means like the square is on the log and not on the n itself. So like it's not the logarithm of n squared. It's like this is the same as like log n squared, like, like so. Which is not the same as logarithm of n squared, right? Logarithm of n squared is 2 log n. Yeah, yeah, so, so why? I mean, I didn't explain it. Uh, yeah, and you know, it's not obvious that it is that. I'm just saying I'm announcing what it is. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll see why, why it is that. Uh, but interesting how these didn't have the same time complexity, right? Uh, OK, so let's understand like, why. So basically, to understand the time complexity of the top-down solution, yeah, of course, if we just kind of analyzed it crudely, we might even miss it. We might just say, like, oh, okay, this probably evaluates all the cases from 0 to n minus 1 anyway. Probably has the same time complexity. But let's say we actually draw the recursion tree. Uh, so first of all, kind of a quick fact. If you, if you have the truncating division of n over a for some, like, constant a, and you further truncating divide that by b, this will be, in fact, n over a b. Like, like, I'm not just stating like something that is like completely dead obvious here, because uh, like you have to, you do have to check that this is true for like integer arithmetic, right? Because like this is true algebraically for like real numbers, right? But this is not like the division here is truncating division; it's not regular division. But you can, it's easy to show that this is still true. Uh, like if you first truncating divide something by a. And then truncating divide that total again by b, you will, it will be the same as if you multiplied the two numbers and did the truncating division that way. So you know, we, do have to, we do have to acknowledge that this doesn't follow like, from the fact that real numbers are divided that way. We have to prove it separately. Um, it's not hard to prove this. Like, you can just do it by like, kind of taking a number and saying, like, OK, let's say it has this many multiples of a, b. You know, can you show that like, what the, it, it's easy to show this. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to skip it in the interest of time. Uh, OK, so now let, well, let's say you have, you have a case where you call the f of n. Right, so this is f of n. 
what is this actually called? Like, let's let's actually draw the call tree of what this calls. N over two. N over three. Uh, N over four. Okay, what is N over two called? N over two by two. Okay. N over two by three. N over two by four. Okay. How about n over 3? Well, look at this. n over 2 by 3. Hey, uh, okay, so there's some, there's some overlap. Okay, good, good. I guess we're using some dynamic programming. Um, and then this is 3 by 3 and 3 by 4, right? n over 3 by 4. more obvious, I'm actually going to write the, all the fours as additional products of twos. So like a four is two times two. So this is, and, and I'm going to write, you know, multiple twos as like powers. So this is n over two squared. Like n over two results in n over two over two, which is n over two squared. And this is n over two times three, and this is n over two cubed. Does that make sense? Because it's n over two over four, which is two squared, so n over cubed. 2 cubed, and this is n over 2 times 3, n over 3 squared, and this is n over 3 times 2 squared, and this is n over 2 squared, and this n over 4 case that we generated originally, and then it will spawn further cases like n over 2 cubed, n over 2 squared times 3, which is the same as this case, this is the same as that case, or sorry, this is the same as uh, this case. And then we'll also get like an n over 2 to the fourth. Okay? So we see, like, like now, now do you see something clear here? Which is that clearly we are not going to cover all the numbers between 0 and n minus 1 here, or even 0 and n over 2, right? There's basically a lot of cases that are never evaluated over the course of this recursion. Like in the space from zero to n, right? Previously in our bottom-up solution, we decided to compute all of them. But most of them will never be needed. Uh, why not? Because every case that is ever evaluated, like it always gets multiple, it always gets divided by twos and threes. So basically, the, the, even, even as you keep going down, you'll just get powers of two and three dividing n. So that actually means that every case ever in this recursion tree has some form like this for some index i and some index j. It always has some form like n divided by 2 to the i of power, 3 to the j of power, for some values of i and j. I mean, is that pretty clear? Like, uh, do you see like why that is? Because you're always dividing by powers of twos and threes, and because of, and you know, you're always going to have these like divisions by twos and threes. Now, how many distinct cases of this form can exist? Well, it's not many actually. So, what is the maximum value of i in the, in this equation? Because remember, at like some point, the value just becomes zero, right? The value just becomes zero at some point. So what is the maximum value of i in terms of n in this equation? Well, yeah, so it basically, so for this to be non-zero, it would have to be that 2 to the i is less than or equal to n, right? Which implies So basically, like very quickly, like what this is saying is very quickly, i gets to the point where 2 to the i of power would be greater than n, and the whole thing would just go to 0. Yeah. Because this is also at least 1, right? Like for even if j is 0 here, like all the powers are non-negative. So if j, is, if j is 0, then this goes to 1. Then this is just 1. But, but so, so like this is either adding even more division to the number, or just like 0, or, you know, or this 3 to the j is 0, and then 3 to the j is 1. But, but either way, like, i can never exceed this, because if i ever exceeds this bound, then this, this number by itself, this type 2 to the i of power by itself, will be greater than n. And if it's greater than n, then we just 
But then since this is at least one, this whole denominator is greater than n. And then this whole thing goes to zero. Should we base that on j because j, that sign no, no, well, goes quickly? No, uh, no, no. First, uh, we we got to calculate a bound for i, and we got to calculate a bound for j. So, like, this is a bound for i. Like, it could be even smaller if j is large. You're right. But this is just you know being just kind of pretty liberal with it. We're saying like even if j is like you know the lowest possible value, like still i cannot be less than zero. Okay. What about j? Well, j is going to have like a similar thing, of course. Yeah, phase three. Yeah, because 3 will appear here in the equation for j, right? You know, because also 3 to the j is less than that. Okay? Now, we could try to establish even tighter bounds based on the fact that, like, basically i and j cannot be large together. If i and j are both, like, close to this limit, then we'll exceed n again. But, you know, we don't even have to go that far. Like, it's pretty clear what's happening here. Um, uh, it's pretty clear what's happening. So basically, i is within a logarithmic range, and j is within a logarithmic range. So that basically, me, and i and j can kind of vary independently, though, you know, there may be even further restriction uh, based if like i and j are both large. But, but okay. Um, well, okay, so you could at least say that, um, you know, if j goes up to like half this value, and i can, can goes up to half this value, then they can like vary together independently. Because, uh, you know, if, if i is at half this value, then this will only go up to like square root of n, and if I, j is half this value, it'll only go up to square root of n, and they can vary together. So clearly, like both, like, both i and j can vary independently within the logarithmic range. So how many different combinations of i, j can there be? How many total distinct cases? Well, like, i can be anything in this range, right? j can be anything in this range. So, uh, well, not anything, but most things. Uh, at least half this range. At least half this range. Uh, so basically, it is basically order log, some log, times some other log, which we write as the square of the log. So basically, there's this many cases. There's this many states. So, so you see, you see what, how, what happens. In the top-down solution, there's only this many states. Uh, there was not like that order n states we evaluated in the bottom-up programming. Because in the bottom-up program, we were very crude. We didn't identify like what states they evaluated. And so we kind of made this mistake, and we, did, we evaluated too many states. But there's actually only this many states to evaluate. And the, either way, top-down or bottom-up, the time per state is order one. This is an order one formula. So the total time complexity is just the number of states, because the time per state is you know this many states. Uh, order one time per state. And so we get a total here, right? Order log square n, square of the log, time. OK. So is, is log 2 and log 3 uh, just a constant multiple difference? Or? Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all logs are equivalent within a constant when they have a constant in the base. Log 2 and log 3 are equivalent within a constant. Yeah, yeah. That's like a very like standard uh, result you, you always use when doing like time complexity analysis. So if you really wanted to do this bottom up, could you instead of just going zero, one, two, three, four, could you go, do like jumping by two and three or something? Yeah, and that's the right idea. And this is kind of why I don't think this is a real example of a case where bottom up is less efficient than top down. Than top down. I think it's more like, I, I just want to illustrate a point here, which is that bottom up, we kind of immediately jumped, like trying to do it bottom up, immediately led us to a solution, uh, an implementation decision that was suboptimal, where we decided that we would actually calculate everything. And because of that, we evaluated order n states rather than evaluating only the square of the logarithm states. But it, we can fix this problem. Uh, we can make our bottom-up solution have this time complexity too if we ensure that we're only evaluating the necessary states in our bottom-up solution. So as long as we remedy that problem and we're only evaluating the necessary cases, then this will be fine and we'll be able to do it. And you know, we will also be able to solve this uh, with that same complexity using bottom-up. 
Uh, so how would we do that? Well, we know all states have this form. So the most logical thing, of course, is just, you know, make those the function parameters. Like let f of i, j, uh, like let, let's reparameterize this function. Let's not write it like this. Uh, f, let f of i, j be the solution. Like let f of i, j basically be the same as if we had done f of n over 2i, 3j. You see, you see what I'm saying? Let's just reparameterize it to the parameters i, j. Then the top solution, uh, then, you know, main, the, ma the main solution is f of 0, 0. This is like the return value we want. Uh, when, when we put 0 here, we put 0 here, the denominator becomes 1. And we are just asking for f of n. This is the top levels. This is the like, initial call we want to make. OK, so let's write you know, the formula for f of i, j. So um, f of i, j, uh, well, uh, 0 if, you know, I'm just copying it from here. 0 if n equals 0. Yeah, 0 if n equals 0. Like, uh, what is n here, though? n is, uh, like, we, we have to, we, we have to, like, figure out what basically the, like, um, we, we have to figure out what the, like, call, what, what parameter we were called here with. Um, actually, well, let, let's just, um, um, I, I want to change the variable name because I, n is confusing because n appears from here. Uh, let's call it, let's call it x. Or let's call it like, yeah, let's call it x. x is basically the initial value we want to solve for. So like, so basically we want to solve, initially we wanted to get the answer for a coin of x. Like, we, like we, the, the coin we want an answer for is x. Right? So, so now we're basically defining f of ij to be f of x over this. And because of that, the solution we want is, you know, the, the, va the value of this coin of x is uh, f of 0, 0. And uh, like, this is like the total, like, this is like the best solution for this coin. This is like the best solution we can get for this coin. Uh, it's going to be f 0, 0 because that translates to just f of x. Um, or I'll give this function a different name. I'll call it g. You know, uh, that is better. I know why I opened it, right? OK, maybe, maybe this is less confusing. So basically, I want to use this, but I only want to use it with valid indexes of i and j. So I reparameterize them. Instead of having a function f that takes one parameter n, I instead have a function g that takes parameters i, j. And basically, f g of i, j is just, is just uh, defined like this. So basically, now i and j will be like parameters that, that you know, are integers and vary. Um, and this is just mapping it to the, the values of f that I actually want to calculate. Um, and I'm saying, you know, like, my main answer, like, this is what I want to get. Uh, the value of this coin will be g of 0, 0, which is f of x. Okay. So, so then, how can I write this formula? g of ij, now I just copy it from here. If n equals 0, but n was the parameter passed into n, so basically I have to say, I have to think, like, is this? So, so basically, um, I would say, if you know, x over 2i, 3j is 0. Like, that's, that's how I have to write it. You know, if g of ij, if I multiply out these powers and I see that this leads to 0 in the truncating division. So x is basically also a parameter to this function, but I don't really show it because it's kind of like a global. It doesn't change over the course of the recursion. x is just the solution, the parameter you want to find the solution for. You, in, in, a, in, a, in code, you would just pass it around, but you wouldn't change it. Uh, it would just be like passing around the dynamic programming cache or anything else. Um, so, uh, so I copy this from here, and then else, I take the max of n. Well, what is n? This is n. So max of x over 2i, 3j, comma. Uh, and what are these terms? So this is f n over 2. So this is x. So n is x, like basically here we are substituting n equals x over 2i, 3j in here. So basically n here becomes x over 2i plus 1, 3j, 
which is defined as g i plus 1 j. Make sense? Uh, th well, this is the, this term. So this term corresponds to this expression. Basically, it's saying increase the, increase the power of the 2 by 1. So, so this is the solution, like, like this here is the solution for x over 2i 3j. That is like what this is the solution for. And this would be the solution for x over 2i plus 1 3j. Make sense? Okay, now I have to add this term. What is this term? Uh, well, here you have to increase the power of 3. And finally, I have to add one more term, right? Um, that is the, uh, yeah, I have to add like one more term here that is uh, i plus 2, exactly. Uh, so you keep the same power of 3, and uh, you have uh, g of i plus 2, j, if that makes sense. Okay? And that's it. Uh, and now we are, you know, in a good position again. Uh, because basically this is the solution for this, and we've expressed it in terms of the solutions of other forms of the same kind of power division, because we knew all cases would have this form and therefore could be expressed in this form. Like that's how we knew to reparametrize it that way. We basically said we know all cases will have a form of being divided by powers of twos and threes. So one case that is divided by powers of twos and threes will be able to be expressed in terms of other such cases. Uh, and so we, based on that, we just write this equation. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically what we have. And then after that, we will just evaluate g of 0, 0. Now, um, the only thing here is you might still think this is not order one, strictly speaking, and it's not unless you implement it correctly, because like there's still these like pesky power operations, right? So if you take a power by like, uh, let, let's say you take a power just in the most naive way, right? Uh, what will actually be the time complexity of it? Um, like, let's say you just take a power by multiplying through i. Well, like this can be order as big as i can be, right? And this can be order as big as j can be. So basically, it could be that evaluating this expression and this expression, like it could be that it's not order one. It could be that it's like order log n or log x. You know, it could be that it's like order log x. Why? Because uh, you know this might have to go. You might have to do up to like log x multiplications to calculate this power. But of course, this can be easily solved. Like we, uh, what we can do is we can just before we begin the algorithm, we can we can build a table of all the powers of two. Uh, like we can we can just build a matrix where you know we will have i over here and we will have j over here, and we will just build a table of like all the you know every row will have, like here we will have two i three j. Like we will just build a matrix of all the powers of twos and threes, uh, because there's only log many, right? There's basically only a logarithmic number of these. Uh, 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 like this dimension is logarithmic, this dimension is logarithmic, so this matrix would be the square of the logarithm in size. And when you're building this matrix, you can very efficiently obtain each entry because you can reuse the value of previous entries. Like, if I want to know what is like 2 to the 5th, 3 to the 3rd, if, if I've already calculated 2 to the 4th, 3 to the 3rd, I will now just take that and multiply it by 2. So that table can be populated in like a simple loop, basically. Basically what you will do is first you will populate like the first row, this is just the power of threes. You will write like 3, 9, 27, 81, etc. You know, you will just use the previous entry and multiply it by three. And then once you've populated the first row, you will apply a similar thing to, you know, move it this way. Now, is, is the, and, and if you do this, then you will be able to do this division in order one, because you already have these powers pre-computed. Now, that returns this expression to being order one, like this is order one, this is order one. Uh, and now, you know, now finally the expression can be calculated in order one, and now finally there are only the square of the logarithm number of cases, and uh, Good news, uh, we are now back to the same time complexity we would have gotten in the first place had we gone top down. Now, is this way more complicated? Sure. This is awesome, the very, very simple on top of But like, like sure, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's basically, 
So this, like, I would say this is not, in my opinion, a real example of top down and bottom up really being different in terms of their time complexity, because they are the same if you can just avoid you know, the pitfalls. Uh, but if you basically evaluate the same cases that you evaluated in top down uh, when, doing bottom, when doing bottom up, you will arrive at the same time complexity. The difference is that because of the different way you kind of conceptualized it, and because you're used to, in, in you know, bottom up, usually you want to go bottom up on problems when you think you have like a very easy way of determining the sequence of evaluations. So of course you want to go for an easy sequence, like just evaluate from zero to n over two. But then that leads to this kind of problem where you might be evaluating a lot of unnecessary cases. So the more, real moral of the story here is that the thing to keep in mind is, you know, j just when you evaluate bottom up, like if you think you have an easy way of doing it bottom up and you decide to go for that optimization in the first place, just be careful that you're not doing any work that the top-down solution wouldn't have done because the top-down solution is actually, actually guarantees that only the cases that are actually necessary for solving the problem are evaluated. Whereas in bottom-up, it's up to you. In bottom-up, you can evaluate whatever cases you want as long as you respect the correct dependency ordering. So you gotta make sure you're not evaluating anything that's unnecessary. Like for example, for I don't know, like Fibonacci problem or whatever, you can prove that it's actually necessary to evaluate all the cases from zero to n minus one in order to get n. But in this problem, it just wasn't the case. Like in Fibonacci, it's very obvious because f of n requires f of n minus one, and what will that require? Of course, it will require f of n minus two and all the way down to zero. But uh, in this problem, that's, it's kind of actually evident from the outset that this is not so, because even if you have like a thousand, Right, if you start with a coin that's a thousand, like it's clear right away that everything from 501 to 999 is skipped, right? And it's actually clear that a lot of the range in between here will be skipped too, because the first call that 500 makes is 250, and even you know, so so there's actually nothing between uh, there's actually nothing between uh, 500 and 333 either. Uh, so it's kind of uh, quite obvious that a big, you know, a very big chunk of the range of space is not actually necessary. Yeah. What is the, the the dimensions of that matrix of powers of two to the i and three to the j? I mean, how far do you go? Well, with... like log log two x and log three x in the grip bit. You know, just basically you go until they would be the the powers would be so big that they would make the case a base case, which is zero. Yeah. How, how, I mean, I never thought about it this way. Well, this is why I show these things, because I, I mean, it may be kind of counterintuitive, and you might find it surprising that these things had different time complexity. At least if you, like, really understand dynamic programming, you understand that there shouldn't really be a difference between top down and bottom up, because they should be doing the same thing. It's just a matter of how you order the cases, and bottom up is usually more about just o avoiding the overhead of recursion. But in this case, you know, you just kind of made a bad implementation choice as a result of being in this like mindset of top down, or, or, or you know, being in this mindset of how you typically try to do bottom up solutions. But if you actually analyze the problem and you do the right bottom up solution, it was still will have the same time complexity. So then, um, the disadvantage if you do a bottom top down with memoization, uh -huh. then you are guaranteed that you will hit only hit the states that are actually going to be there. So you don't have to do the whole state analysis. Yeah, that's true. Right? Which is why top, like, it, it does seem like top down has endless advantages, is it not? But, uh, yeah, but then what about the depth of the recursion tree where it runs out of stack space? What like, about would, would that be a deterrent to saying, no, I don't want to do top down? I mean, it depends. Like, usually not. I mean, yeah, I mean, usually if you're doing like deep, like top-down recursion, you you know set your settings appropriately so that you know you the your your environment allows you to use more stack space because often solutions require that. But yeah, no, like usually it shouldn't be a deterrent. Okay. Um, okay. Next problem. Okay, so next problem is another example of this kind of thing. Uh, simple example, and then I will, uh, y you know, this next problem I'll just like very quick show. Uh, and then I'll do like one more problem which kind of shows the opposite effect. That, believe it or not, uh, top down seems like it can be slower. Like, how, now how can that be? Well, that's, that, that one I think is the wildest example. 
Because that one is actually like, I think that one is the closest you get to like a legitimate example of these things actually being different. Uh, okay, so basically the answer is that the bottom up solution will allow us to cheat in an additional way to reduce the time complexity. Uh, but okay, let's, let's see this other problem first. This one kind of has a similar issue as the first one. So this is the famous skier slope problem, very classic problem. So the problem is you have a grid of numbers. Let's say they're all positive. Okay. Uh, and this is basically a height map. This shows elevations on a mountain. Think of like a bar coming out depend on the, depending on the size of the number. It's a height map. Okay. Uh, you, you want to create a ski course, a ski route on this mountain. So the rules for the ski route is the ski route should start at some elevation, and you should be moving, uh, you know, you should always be moving downwards. Like the next portion of the ski route has to be at a lower altitude than the previous version. Um, and it has to be adjacent. And for, like, you know, you can do a version of this problem where you're allowed to move in all eight diagonals. It changes nothing about the problem, really. But let's say, we, for now, we just allow uh, j just the four directions. So for example, if I start my route here, I could, I could plan a route that goes like this. Uh, so if I go to five, now I have to go lower. So I can't go up to seven. I can't go to this four because that's a diagonal move. So OK, so uh, yeah, so here I would get a route of size four. The core question here is what is the best route you can construct, best being longest. longest. So I think, for example, here there might be like a much better longer route than this. Like for example, well, this route kind of sucks as well. If I get like 16, uh, maybe start at this 10 or something. Like let's say 10, like if you could do like 10, 9, 7, 6. Yeah, already you could do 10, 9, 7, 6, uh, 3, 2, or you can do 7, 5, 3, 1. There can be ties. If there's ties, you know, just pick any one. Uh, maybe maybe this is like a good route. This has, uh, you know, this one has uh, six elements in it. This looks like a DFS problem. From each well, but, uh, perhaps, but um, it's a dynamic programming problem. I mean, like, keep in mind that DFS, I mean, memoized DFS is top-down dynamic programming. You might not realize this, but like, top-down dynamic programming is a DFS on the recursion tree with memoization in each node. Like that is, like, like what, what is recursion? Recursion is DFS, right? Like that is what recursion does. Recursion traverses the different function calls in a DFS-like manner. When you add memoization, DFS with memoization is top-down dynamic programming. So yeah, it is a DFS problem. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, Okay, uh, yeah, so, so let, let's say you solve this top down, right? Okay, so, so real quick, like what's the recurrence? It's pretty easy. So, uh, you know, you take some position x, y, right? Uh, like, like this is the best route starting at position x, y. Uh, what is it? So basically, it, it is equal to one if no lower neighbors. So if, if all four neighbors around you, or you know, fewer neighbors if you're at a wall, if no neighbors around you, out of all of your neighbors, none are lower than you, then you are done, and your ski route is limited to this one square. Uh, otherwise, the best route starting in x, y is one plus um, f of neighbor, It is, it is one, well, let's write it this way. It is one plus max over all neighbor, uh, over all n in neighbors. Max over all n in neighbors in lower neighbors, right? Uh, that's important. This seems like a lot of words, but it's not that complicated, right? Uh, it's basically, basically, uh, if you, if you, at your current position you have nowhere to go, then your answer is one. If at your current position you have 
options for where to go, choose the one that is best. Choose the one that then leads to a, a longer run. So, uh, well, neighbor is like an xy coordinate. Yeah, so basically f of xy equals 1 if there, you have no lower neighbor, or 1 for yourself plus the best neighbor, so max over, oh, I meant to write it this way. plus max over all n who are lower neighbors. Max over all n, n being an xy coordinate, uh, or like call it, you know, I'll call it pos for position, right? Uh, max over all positions that are lower neighbors of f of position. One plus means our self means yes. our own value, right? Yes, yes, yes. So it should be not just one, maybe the value of our self. Like starting with 10, it should be 10 plus. Maximum. No, 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 no. The, like, you're not collecting a total. The goal of this um, problem is to find the longest route. It doesn't matter what your value is, only like the relative ordering of the values matters. It's the length of the route. The goal is to find the longest route. Yeah, so you get one if there is no lower neighbor, because then that, that you are just confined to yourself. Otherwise, one for yourself plus max over all lower positions next to you of f of that position. So for example, uh, like f of here, f of 0, 0, which is like, well, you know, I'm treating this position as 0, 0, is going to be, you find all lower positions, which is this one and this one. So, you know, well, I'm taking, I'm interpreting y to go in this direction, like 0, 1, 2, 3, and x to go in this direction as 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So, basically, the way I'm interpreting it is uh, f of 0, 0 equals, um, uh, you know, basically 1 plus max of, and now I have to check, I have to check my four neighbors. Like this max, it will have like a, you know, some conditional logic inside of it. I have to check what are my lower neighbors because for every cell I have to check, is it a lower neighbor or is it a higher neighbor? But I see both that I have two neighbors, you know, because these two are walls. I have two neighbors that here and here. And uh, uh, they're both lower than me. So basically I can take both of these. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is like a pretty simple concept, right? So in terms of the code, it'll just be like, uh, basically, for f of x, y, like, I will do a loop. I will loop over my four neighbors. For each of the four neighbors, I will check, is this in bounds? If it's in bounds, then I will consider it further. But if, it, if I consider it further, I will check, is it lower? If it's lower, then I include it in this max. If I find nothing to consider in the max, I just return one. If I have some elements to consider in the max, um, I take the best of them and I, uh, I add one to it and I return. Uh, easy to write the code for this. We will do this over all x, y. Yes, yes. Oh, and then what is the final solution? Unlike most dynamic programming problems where you know you have a general expression for like x, y, and then you you know you just say just say like the final answer is zero zero. Here I have no constraint on when I can start. So basically here what I should do is I should try starting at every possible position, uh, but I should you know, you, you keep using the same cache. So basically, first I will call, like basically I, I will actually call this top level function for every combination of, F, of x and y, because I don't know where I should start, right? So I will have this formula and I will have a cache, initially my cache will be empty, and then I will basically say for every possible x, for every possible y, make this function call. But between function calls, I will reshare the same cache. So that still guarantees that in the end, I will never evaluate any state more than once. Even if like, for example, in my evaluation of f of zero, zero, I may end up using the f of one, zero. And when I call f of one, zero directly, I may end up using that value again. But I will reuse the same cache between calls, so I will not ever evaluate anything twice. For the cache, uh, we will have to store where I came from, right? No, no. no. Well, because the goal is just to find the, the goal is just to find the maximum route. 
I mean, if you wanted to sort where you came from, like, well, sure, you could store that too, but it's not, it's not a problem. The reason why I was thinking is, uh, let's say we have, uh, I don't know, f of uh, 2 comma 1, which is 5. Uh -huh. So, depending on where I came from, that cell may have a different length of the route. Would it be the case? Like, no, no, no. Uh, no. Uh, well, it, it, it doesn't matter because f of x, y is basically, f of x, y is just the best route from the current okay. position. It doesn't include like the best route from where you came from. It doesn't matter. Like f of x, y is the best route from, from x, y, not from any other place. Irrespective of wherever I might have come from. Correct, uh -huh. correct. But that's always how it works in dynamic programming, right? Yeah. Like in every dynamic programming problem, it's like that. When I define like, when for like the robber, in the robber problem, I define f of i, I'm saying, if you start robbing houses at index i, what is your best value? I'm not, like, of course you may have robbed houses before you get to index i. That's just like a natural consequence of dynamic programming. Uh, that's usually how you do it. You say, what is your current state? And in your current state, what is the best solution between your current state and the end goal? Yeah, so uh, here we are basically saying uh, f of x, y. What is, uh, what is the best answer for starting at x, y and then ending until you know, your end goal, which is to go as far as possible? You don't know where you will end, but it's as far as possible. And this is the equation. Uh, you know, one if no lower neighbor, else one plus max over all for your lower neighbors. Uh, okay, what is the time complexity of this? Top down, top down, time complexity. Not a trick question. Okay, and you have at most four neighbors to consider. Uh, you, you consider at most a constant number of neighbors. All the checks are constant to see if they're downstream from you or not. Uh, so this formula is order one. This is an order one formula. O, o, o x into y. Yeah, exactly. It's order, like, if this dimension is m and the other dimension is n, then order m n. Yeah, order, exactly. So. So, you know, it's number of states multiplied by time per state. Time per state is order one. Number of states is x dimension times y dimension. So it's basically order x, you know, x dimension times y dimension. Okay, how do you solve this problem bottom up? Like, this is the recurrence. You know, like, we do have a recurrence. Uh, how, how, do you solve, how do you solve this bottom up? We can start by... Well, you can start by populating the from the bottom right corner. Why? So Why? Right no, right? You, you can't. Oh, you like, right. like actually, that's even demonstrably false in this example. In this example, you cannot start with evaluating six. You start because one. six would depend on one, but you haven't evaluated one yet. Yeah, start like um, which of the neighbors I could come from at that point. So, which of my neighbors are contributing to my value? What? Well, like, what does that? What does that even mean? So like uh, initially everything would be zero, and then at six I would say I can come from sixteen. So six would get a value of one, and then I can use that as I. But it's not one. Like the correct value for six is two, six one. The correct value for this cell is two, because you can go here, and your your the best ski route starting in here is uh, a route of size two that contains these two. So you have to sort the uh, the matrix and then start at the, the yeah. Values. You have the right idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta gotta sort. You gotta sort. You gotta do the smallest numbers first, right? So this is a strategy that is clearly correct. Like this clearly respects the dependency order. Uh, you basically the idea is you fill it, fill in the numbers in order of their size. And why is that correct? Because remember, like this equation explicitly only references smaller numbers, right? To evaluate f of x, y, we explicitly say that the answer is one plus max over all positions who are lower. So if, if I evaluate the lowest ones first, then by the time I evaluate a higher one, I definitely have access to f of position for all of the ones that are lower. Okay, great. So solu simple solution, right? We will basically emit kind of like triplets like this, where we have like a value and then we have an x and a y, you know, x, y, value. We will emit triplets like this, 9, 1, 0, value, you know, value, x, y. We will emit these triplets and we will just sort these tuples by the first entry. 
uh, uh, you know, sort in, sort in uh, ascending order by the first entry, and then we will just loop through them. Uh, great, right? Only, what is the time complexity of this? Well, the sort takes n log n. So, like, remember how top down we had an order n solution? Well, now, now we will require a sort, and the sort is n log n. Or, oh, okay, uh, n log n, like what do I mean? Like, okay, there's two dimensions. Call, call the dimensions like m and n, right? So like previously we just had a solution that was straight out like order mn. Now we will emit order mn tuples and then we will sort them in order mn log mn time. So we have now worsened our time complexity by a log factor over what is possible with the top down. So what is the problem here? Like, how do you fix it? What's the, what's the fix? Can you just repeat that? What, what, how, how are we sorting everything else here? Uh, like, like, oh, okay. I mean, sort it however you want. Like, the concept is not hard here. Like, the concept here is just, you, you need to fill this in from smallest number to largest number. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so how do you do that? Like, how would you know which numbers are smallest? Like, I suppose you would have to, like, probably emit triplets where you, you know, emit, like, the value x and y, and then you sort by value. I mean, do, do the sort however you want. But, like, you know, just think about how, how would you implement, like, this sort. Like, it doesn't help you to just put all the values in an array and sort them, right? Because then, like, okay, I, great, I have a sorted array of the values. How do I know where to find those values in the array? So you could use a bucket sort, and that's oh, not in the log in. Okay, so somebody says, like, fix this by doing a bucket sort, but wait, no, no, that doesn't make sense. Because I, I didn't say that the numbers were in a small range. Like, these numbers can be any value. Like, the time, co the order of n co time complexity uh, obtained by the top-down solution, it does not reference the values being in a small range. It does not depend on that assumption. Uh, so, you can't introduce an additional assumption to, you know, make it order of n. Uh, that, that doesn't count. So, how do you fix it? Like, why is the, the top-down slower? Like, it, it's because it has to, or rather, why is the top-down faster? Because the top-down actually doesn't do a sort, right? The bottom-up is, is uh, actually doing a sort. I might wish in top-down, the value doesn't matter, right? You just want to find out the longest root. Like, how long is the root? Like, well, the value matters in terms of how values compare to other values. But the absolute value doesn't matter. If we sort, are, are we not losing the case? Like, how do we know that we can go from that value to the next value? Because the indices might be apart. Again, um, like, it's all about respecting the dependency ordering. Like, it's all about, like, whenever you call a function, in, like, like, the essence of bottom-up, right, is that when you, when, when you are calling a function, uh, you have to, you know, it has to be that whatever you would have recursively called is already evaluated. How can you ensure that? Is is the is the question on all bottom-up solutions? This is like this is like a general principle. This is not like specific to this problem. Like in a in a bottom-up solution, like you always have to ensure that you can replace this f with just a reference to the cache, which means that the functions have to be ordered in such a way that you can guarantee that whatever you're about to access has, is already there. So here you have to do the smallest values first, right? Because other, because any larger, like, like when you evaluate a cell that has a large value, it, you know for a fact that will, it will only ask for values in the cache of neighbors that are smaller than it. So like basically, to, in order to know the best route from this point, I don't need to know the best route from this point because I cannot consider that anyway. This number, need, this cell, needs to know the best route from each of the smaller neighbors in order to do its job. And that's why you sort. But sorting is the, like, the most intuitive way, right? But like, it, it, like, why is the time complexity worse? Be, uh, because you know, somehow, somehow a sort isn't actually necessary here. It seems like it is, but it isn't. So of course, like the solution, uh, you know, I'm just going to show this to you. Like, if you wanted to make the bottom up have the same time complexity, and you would never do this in practice. Like, just go top down, seriously. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to uh, do it, like, what you would have to do is you would have to construct the dependency graph here. You would have to, like, you know, make each cell a node in a graph. 
show the dependency links, like for example this 10 depends on this 4 and depends on this 9. The 9 de does not depend on this 10, but it depends on this 3 and depends on this 7. The 4 does not depend on this 12, because 12 is larger, but 12 does depend on 4. So you would construct basically the directed acyclic graph of dependencies, and then a linear time topological sort of this graph is what you're looking for. Awesome. But, you know, and you know, and that runs in linear time. Like in linear time, you can get the correct sequence and then apply it. But there, there is not surprising that you can do this because after all, um, like what, like, and, and you know, I'm not gonna repeat this because I covered this in the, like the first session and you can always, you know, watch the video if you're interested to learn more. Uh, it is like online on my YouTube channel. Uh, but we did kind of talk about how actually, uh, basically what top-down recursion, what top-down dynamic programming does is it is implicitly a topological sort. That's what it's doing. Like the very action of top-down dynamic programming is to topologically sort the different data dependencies it has. Basically DFS, it is basically DFS topological sort on the dependency graph. And here we would just be doing that explicitly. Which really goes to show that there's no good way to solve this problem bottom up. Because, well, without sacrificing some time complexity, because to, solve, to do it bottom up without sacrificing time complexity, you would, you would manually code a DFS topological sort. And when, when you code a DFS topological sort, you are doing the exact same thing that the recursion would have done. So there really is no shortcut for this problem. I mean, if you want to, if you are super dead set on avoiding recursion, what you can do is you can convert it to this topological sort problem, solve the topological sort by some method that doesn't require recursion, which is possible. Uh, there are like linear time topological sorting algorithms that do not involve recursion. Uh, and then, you know, get the sequence and then apply it here. Like you can avoid recursion if you're hell bent on that, but, you yes. know. This would still need me to uh, sort of construct the whole graph. So memory-wise, it's more bad, right? Like the, another no, like it'll, asymptotically it's the same. It will be like still order and then extra memory. Oh. Okay, so I want to wrap up with the final problem. Um, you know, I'll try to hurry, hurry it along because, you know, we're almost out of time. But I do want to show this last problem because this last problem is kind of cool in that it goes in the other direction. We can actually construct a, we, we can construct, believe it or not, a bottom-up solution that's faster. Now, how on earth is that? It's because we're going to cheat, kind of. Well, the bottom-up solution will enable a special kind of cheating that I don't, that, you know, is hard to see how it's possible with the top-down method. Uh, okay, so we, so we will consider a problem called the Domino's problem. So this is a very nice problem. Now, when I say that, I'm kind of biased because, you know, I invented this problem. Um, this problem appeared in, like, a coding contest I authored once a long time ago like back in 2015, when I worked at a startup that did these things. Okay. Um, so the idea behind dominoes is that it's the dominoes problem. Um, I'm just referring to my phone here because I just have like an example kind of sketched out here. It's kind of hard to find good examples for this problem, so I have one like pre-made on my phone. Um, and, you know, I'll, later I'll share the diagram with you too, because maybe the diagram that I generated by computer is nicer to look at. Um, so, um, here we go. Uh, so basically, the idea of the dominoes problem is you have you, you have basically a bunch of array positions. Like this is position zero, one. So the, basically, these are indexes of an array: two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. Eight. You know, I'll give myself like ten or so. Okay. So um, basically, each um, at each uh, cell in this array, there will be like a number. And if the number is zero, then there is no domino at that position. And if the number is some positive number, there will not be negative numbers, but if the number is some positive number, there is a domino with that height at that position. So in an example I generated, um, I uh, show the following, zero, zero, four, one, zero, two, zero, one, 
zero zero. Okay. And and this is what it looks like. So basically, there is like some like vertical scale. This would be like dominoes of height one, two, three, four, for example. And so basically, here there will be a domino of size four. Uh, make it colorful. Here there is this like domino of size four. Okay, so here there's a domino of size four, and um, and you know here's like a different domino of size one. Like this one is of just height one. Um, well, you know, imagine they don't necessarily have to have like the full thickness. Um, so you know, like this. Um, and here there's some domino of size two. You know, making some other color, uh, just just so it's like easier to visualize and see. Okay, here's a domino of height two, and here there's like a couple more dominoes. You know, we can make them the same color or something. I'm not trying to be an artist here, just, you know, this is so that you can kind of tell them apart a little bit. Okay, so here's some dominoes. Their colors don't matter. This is just like, so if I show some arrows or something, they will be uh, consistent. Uh, so, so what are we looking at here? Well, uh, the idea is basically um, now we will knock over dominoes. You probably expected this, otherwise why there are dominoes. We're going to knock over dominoes, and the and basically you can see that if I, for example, knock over this green domino, uh, what would happen is this falls over proportional to its height, and like these scales are the same. So basically, this two domino falls all the way to this position six. Does that make sense? By the way, if you're like colorblind or something, like the colors are not that important. They're just like a slight assistance. Uh, so you should still be able to see this if you're like colorblind and stuff. Uh, so, so um, you know, this domino falls over. And when it, if it falls over, it will fall forward four positions all the way to the six. Will it leave its current position? Between? No, the base will stay here, and it will lie down like this. But then it should land on like five, right? Um, no, no, it has height four. One, two, three, four. Oh, so it will leave its current column. No, it will lie down and it will. I'm, I'm, I'm really like not understanding like why you would think that. Like, no, it's height four. So like one, two, three, four. Okay. okay. Like, yeah, I, I, I got like I really like, don't understand why that is unclear. Uh, but okay, uh, whatever. Like, just you know, if that somehow physically doesn't make sense, um, well, I guess if you're assuming that it's like thin or something, so it's covering index. Three. But 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 you know, the, the, yeah, the point is it covers from its current index to the one that's its current index plus its height, uh, inclusive of that one. So, for example, if you start at two and you fall over, you know, and you have a height of four, it'll get hit everything up to six, including anything that's at six. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. How about this one at three? It will uh, just fall over and hit anything at four. Uh, how about this one at uh, two? It will fall over and hit anything up to this position of seven. So that means it will hit this little. This one would fall over and hit anything up until here. And uh, this one, you know, would fall and, uh, you know, hit here. Okay. Uh, and basically what this problem asks for is when you push over a domino, it starts a cascade. So, for example, you push over this green one, right? This green one will hit this one and this one as it falls. As it falls, these will also fall to the right. So for example, uh, this one will fall over and not hit anything, but as this green one falls, it will knock over this purple one, uh, this one, and it will fall and hit this one, which will then fall here. And if there was like another domino here, if there was like a five domino here, it would still be able to knock it over, and that five domino would continue, and it would also get this one, and the cascade would continue. So is the problem statement pretty clear? Like, is it clear like how they fall? 
Like basically, when you knock over a domino at position i, it hits all, on its way down, it hits all the other dominoes from i plus one to i plus its height inclusive. Uh, and you know, those in turn continue falling and they can knock over additional things. Uh, and the question now is basically, what is the reach of each domino's cascade? So basically, you are expected for each, like the output, the expected output here is for each one, you will put, you will give me like a number saying how far it fell. So for example, uh, the answer to these zero cases doesn't matter, but for this one, the cascade goes like, it doesn't just go to six because you also knock over this one, and this one goes to seven, but then this one also falls over and goes to eight. So here, actually, the answer is eight. And here, the, here the answer is just four. Because this one, if it falls by itself, it will not knock over anything. Um, if you knock over this one, the cascade continues until eight. So the, here the answer is eight. Here the answer is eight. And here the answer is 11. So basically, you're asked to compute the reach of these cascades. Now, what is a naive algorithm? The naive algorithm is very simple, which is just like pure direct simulation of each individual domino. Basically, algorithm is for each domino, try knocking it over and simulate its cascade. Here's how you do it. You take this domino, uh, you, you, you know, you, for each domino, let's say you, you took this one, you um, basically, uh, you know, you get the current reach of the cascade. So the current reach of this cascade is this arrow, it's six. Then you will check every index up to six. And for every index, you will basically say the current cascade is the maximum of, of this max I have so far, six and any new cascade that gets started. So for example, at this three, you will say this will go three plus one, but that's just four, that's less than six, so never mind. Then you will uh, get to this one, and you will say, oh, but it also knocks over a domino at five, five plus two is seven, that's more than six, so now my, my cascade continues until seven. I will simulate up all the way up to seven, and at seven I will say I now have a cascade that's seven plus one is eight, and then at eight I will say I'm done. So basically, at any given time, you will maintain like your current maximum cascade. You will simulate up to that point, and if ever there comes a point where you've simulated until the end and you don't have like a new cascade to add on, then it's done at that point. So that simulation could take up to a linear time, right? You could like you could imagine like dominoes fall and they knock over most of the array. So that will consume linear time, but the problem is it's per domino. So the overall algorithm will be n squared. Make sense? Well, it'll be n times the average length of a cascade. Okay, now there, there are many solutions to this problem. The optimal one is not the one we're gonna discuss. Like the optimal one is just, you can find a clever like stack-based solution here that just runs purely in linear time. And in linear time, you can get all these cascades. Don't even ask me like what, what that solution is. I'm not gonna discuss it because that's, you know, very sidetracking. Um, you know, you can ask me after the session maybe. Uh, but, you know, and uh, there's also like a very beautiful like divide and conquer algorithm available here, which I'm also not going to discuss, n log n. Uh, the, basically, it consists of splitting the array in two, solving the two halves independently, and then doing kind of a, like a reconciliation step, where if anything on the left side has fallen over onto the right side, you basically kind of add on some additional value there. Uh, so very nice n log n algorithm. But, but, you know, all of those are kind of complicated, you might kind of come up with a very simple dynamic programming algorithm here. What is, what is the, the very simple dynamic programming algorithm? If you start it at the right hand side and... Uh, no, 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 the uh, recurrence. Like, you, you know, you are basically already speeding forward to the, uh, you know, bottom-up solution, which is fine, but like, uh, what is the recurrence? Sorry, what was the objective of to find that? Uh, you basically have to just print out, like, for each domino, uh, print out the, like, what index its cascade stops at. So, oh, okay, so, so what is the recurrence? So basically f of i, we will give a recurrence like f of i, and we will basically say f of i is the... Um, if, if, if i have been infected by... It's basically the answer at index i. So what is the in answer to index i in terms of the answers to other indexes? 
Well, okay, so first of all, we have to consider the current dominoes fall, because it could be that the current domino falls further than anything else in the cascade, right? Like this falls over, let, let's, say, let's say there was just this guy, right? This falls over, knocks this one over, but the, really the reach is limited more by like the height of this. So we do have to take the max of two things. One is i plus height of i. Uh, like this is the starting index of the cascade. This is the height of the domino there. Okay, so max of this, and there will be some other term in our max, will there not be? And what is that other term? Like, what other term should we add? Basically, max over, well, the second argument to this max is another max. It is max over uh, some index j, right, from i plus 1 to i plus h of i, right, of f of j. So this is basically saying, to take the maximum of the current domino's reach and the reach of all other dominoes that it hits. And when we say the reach, we mean like the full reach, any cascade that it triggers, which, which is the solution to this very problem, right? Like, so basically for index i, we want to take the best of what this current domino does when it falls, and the effect of every other domino falling. The, every other domino that it hits initially. Because it has to hit some domino initially to trigger a cascade, right? So the, consider the effect of all the dominoes it hits initially. So in this case, the dominoes that this one hits initially are just this and this. And for, for each of these two, we look at the full reach of their cascade, not just what they immediately knock over, but the full solution to the problem, like everything they get down the line, then we've considered everything. So this is the, you know, this is the, like, uh, dynamic programming solution. What is the time complexity? So it's actually order n. There are n states. Time per state depends on the height. So the time complexity here is, well, the time complexity here is order n times average height. Yeah, so it can be n squared in principle if like the, you know, array, if all the dominoes are like the size of the array, this can happen. However, like in practice, like if a lot of the, like this is much better than n times the average length of a cascade. Because it's not hard, like in the naive solution, it's n times the average length of a cascade. And it's very much not hard for, you know, a lot of cascades to be the length of most of the array. It's pretty easy for, you know, there to be like a long, long cascade that you have to simulate for a long time. But this is a little bit better. This is not like length of the cascade. This is just, this is just the height. This is just, uh, this is just the immediate height of the current domino. So for example, for this one, it'll only take one step. For this one, it'll only take two steps. This one just four steps, not until like as far as its cascade goes. Because, like, like think of it this way: like a domino's cascade is is at least its height, but usually it's a lot more. Right. Okay. So time complexity is this. Okay. Now I claim a bottom. The, so the, the top down solution will definitely have this time complexity. Now I claim a bottom up solution that will solve the problem in either but with using the same recurrence more or less. We'll solve the problem. So this is like top down this order nh. And bottom up, I claim that I will solve it in order n log h, or something like that. Now, how will I do this? Well, well, first of all, OK, back to your idea now. I'm back to your idea now. What is uh, you know, the bottom up solution for this problem? Uh, you know, start from the back, right? You got to start from the back uh, because because you can see that values of i depend on j that are greater than i here. So uh, basically, you start from the back, you start the simulation from the back, and then you uh, you know you go to the front, right? Oh well, we're asking when the dominoes are pushed to the right. If we're asking about what happens when a domino is pushed to the left, then it's the opposite effect, um, right? Like you know. Uh, yeah, obviously then you would have to start from the front and go forward. Uh, so here you, you, know, you go, you go uh, from the back. Okay, and if you just evaluate this formula from the back, element by element, it will definitely still be this time complexity. 
But now I have an idea, uh, which is, you know, so I'm basically filling out this answer array as I go. So, you know, wh whenever there's no domino, you just fill in like a placeholder. Like you can fill in the current index, or just to make it clear, I'll fill in zero. Um, so, you know, I'm filling out this answer array as I go. Here I, here I am filling it out. Okay. And let's say it's time to uh, evaluate this value. So let's say, let's say I'm here. I still don't have these values. And it's time for me to compute this. Right? Like, what is this equation actually saying? This is just like unadulterated f of j. It's just basically saying, take the max of some number of f of j's. So basically, the value, like this computation, which is the expensive piece of this computation, like this part is very easy, right, in taking the max. <coughs> the hard part is this loop, right? That, that is where I'm spending my time complexity. So right now, like the naive solution will be, I will go forward up to four positions from here. So I will visit this one, this one, this one, and this one, right? That is, that is what I would do. And I would take the max of them, and that would, would be what I would return. And I would do this in a loop. Now I say, why use a loop? I say there are uh, data structures that can efficiently return the maximum of a subarray. That is like a well-studied problem. Okay, so yeah, so um, you don't have to, okay, so obviously you would never think to do this if you don't know about the existence of such data structures, uh, if you don't know how to do this. And it's not like a very like simple concept, like basically what we need here is we need to uh, we need a data structure that basically you give it a query i j, like an index i and j, and it returns the maximum of that subrange of the array. And also, it needs to handle updates because the array is like we, we don't have the array pre-existing. We're kind of populating it as we go. So it's a data structure where, like you know, initially this will be filled with like zeros, but as we go, we're going to update. We're going to update this, right? So there's a data structure that does this, it's called a segment tree. Now, you may not know what a segment tree is, and don't worry, it's like, for today's thing, it's like not important by the, like, for you to know this, for you to know like what the data structure actually does. I'm just kind of giving you the contract of what it does. Basically, given, given an array, it supports two operations. One is basically to set a value at a particular index, and the other operation it supports is you will have the ability to um, you know, give it an index i and j, and it will return to you the maximum uh, value between i and j. So basic, and, and not only that, but it will do all of these operations in logarithmic time. It's a data structure that's designed for this. It's kind of like a little bit like a tree internally, and it works in logarithmic time. So now I will cheat. I will use this data structure to optimize this operation. Like, I need the max of these four elements, but instead of doing it in, like, time proportional to four, uh, okay, yeah? What is the, the array called, I mean, the data structure called? It's, it's called a segment tree. Segment tree, okay. Now, I don't expect people attending to, like, know necessarily about this. I'm, like, obviously you wouldn't think to do this if you don't know about this, but I'm just using this as an example. You don't have to, like, know how it works. Uh, to understand this explanation. You just have to know that it, like, it exists. I mean, in theory, you can have it as just as like a library. You can just use it as a black box. Okay, and so, what, and so we know what the black box does. It returns uh, the maximum of a subrange. So now, so, so now, here's what I will do. I will run this algorithm, but every time I need to do this operation, I will not do it in order h time. I will do it in order log h time by leveraging this data structure. And as a result of this, my bottom-up solution will improve to order n log h. And it's not clear how I could ever get the same thing with uh, the top-down solution, right? Because, like, the top-down solution, like, you will definitely insist on calling these recursive calls. I don't even know that I'm going to make the recursive calls until I need them. And I, there's no way I could really do this segment tree trick because, uh, in top down, at the time that I evaluate this, I don't have these values, right? I might evaluate f of zero, and it says, okay, to know f of zero, you have to know these other values of f, which you don't currently have. So then it's really unclear, like, how could you ever avoid, you know, doing it, 
you know, actually calling each recursion because if you if you use so much as open each recursive call that you're supposed to open in the top-down solution, you will definitely incur order each time. So basically here we managed to cheat. We said top-down and bottom-up is the same thing, but here like basically when we when it came time to do the bottom-up solution, we didn't really do the things we said we were gonna do. We didn't really uh, access each element of the cache here and do this loop. Instead, we actually uh, had some additional data structure that was like kind of like pre-processing the data in the cache to additionally provide us a time complexity benefit. And this kind of leads us to this like better time complexity. So it's exploiting like an optimization that's pretty particular to this problem, but you know, kind of a nice idea nonetheless. And this brings the solution close to linear time. Though, like I said, it's not even the most impressive thing considering, considering um, that we are actually able to uh, solve you know, the whole problem in linear time using just like a stack. But, you know, it's, it's a very nice idea. It's basically, you took, like, this is a very intuitive, I think, problem solving methodology because you kind of took a pretty, like, this is like a pretty easy recurrence to come up with, I think. This, like, makes a lot of sense. This is like a very intuitive solution. Like, just, you know, knock over the current domino and see what else it knocks over and take the maximum of those ranges. Um, and then, you know, you get this NH complexity and then you start to think, okay, how can I optimize it? Oh, look, I can optimize it by, you know, introducing this special advanced data structure. Uh, of course, if you don't know the special advanced data structure, you will just get the same time complexity top down and bottom up. Okay, uh, that's all for today.